way to the gym. Good, let's get the day started here. So, a couple of quick things. Go ahead and throw those quizzes out. I had a couple of quick things I wanted to go over the quizzes there. Uh, whichever one. <laughs> All right. So, a couple of things I want to go over the quizzes. First off, some of you guys have never been in class with me before. I just want to describe how the grading even works. Because they're going to have a whole bunch of numbers on there, and they might not make a little bit of sense. And your mom's going to ask you, what did you get on your quiz? And you're going to go, I'm not exactly sure. So, let me show you how that works, and we'll go from there. All right. So, what usually happens on when I, anything that I grade to you guys, there's going to be basically two numbers. It's going to be something like this, like 10 over 10, for example. So what this means, this top number means how many points you got. That's what you did. And the bottom one is how many points possible. Okay, so for this assignment, there's 10 points. That's a homework assignment. There are 10 points possible. You guys got 10 points. For your quiz, the, there might be, what was it, 15 on this one. So you guys might get things that say something like this, 15, oops, uh, again, 15, and it's like 12 out of 15, right? Something like that. Now, what? Yeah, it's usually 20. Well, but there's, there's a, oh yeah, for some of you guys that don't have that. But, um, so for this one here, there's like 12 out of 15, um, and this one means that there's 15 possible points on the test, you got 12, okay? That's what that basically means. Then what I do, because the points are worth 20 points in the grading book, I then have to kind of scale that up or down, depending on how many points are available on the quiz. So then what you're going to see is something sort of like this. Probably for this one, it would be like 16 over 20. And then I put a box around this one. Okay? That means that the 16, that's what goes into the grading book. Right? So for you guys, that's what goes into the grading book. And every single quiz that I give, I put that many points in the grading book, whatever it is you get. And then at the end of the trimester, I'm going to add those all up, and that'll be your overall quiz score. Um, Go ahead. This is 20 out of 20 plus 20 Right, I haven't gotten that for you. All right, so, uh, so that's, that's what's going to have to work for, for that. Um, something else that I do is I take the lowest quiz score of the trimester, and I drop it. I pretend that it didn't exist. So if you got a poor quiz score, uh, I did the it would be the lowest of the year, and then the lowest of the trimester, and then I just knock it up. So basically, all year you get three quizzes that can basically disappear as if they never happened. So, uh, so that's kind of cool. Because uh, some of you travel, some of you might be sick, some of you might have had a you know an issue, and so that quiz just for whatever reason, all right? So it'll disappear, so you don't have to worry about it ever again. Now, some of you also, on this quiz, some of you did, most of you did, to be honest, may have gotten something like this, like plus one, uh, plus one EC, or plus three EC, or something like this. On this last quiz, there was an extra credit possibility on the bottom. It was anywhere between one point to three points, um, so I gave you guys extra credit. Now, what I do with extra credit is, for example, if you got like a 12 out of 15, I take your extra credit points and I apply them to this score first. So instead of a 12 out of 13, it would be a 13 out of 15. Does that make sense? Okay, so I just move over, mark it up one or two. Um, and then, but if I go all the way up to 20 out of 20, which is the perfect score, you can't do any better than that, then we may actually have some extra credit points left over. So at the top, you may see something like 1 plus 1, you see it. All right? And that means you rock that test if you pull that up. So that's kind of what that means. Now, if you don't understand exactly how I got all of this, it really doesn't matter. I just want to explain to you what happened. And if you want, I can show you the math of how I go from this to this, but chances are you don't really care. It's a nice, fair, easy system. It's just basically a ratio, and we pump it up and out, and we go from there. So, um, so that's kind of how that works. Out. But this in the box is the grade that you get. And then on some of your tests, I'll also put, I'll also put your grade like A's and B's and C's. And the way that works is 100, basically 100 to 90 is an A. 89 to 80 is a B. 79 to 70 is a C, and so on and so forth. Okay? What? Chances are, if you got something lower than a C, I won't necessarily put the grade on your test because you don't necessarily want to see it. <laughs> so I'm going to leave that off if you got lower than a C. Oh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, what if you got like higher than a C, but you didn't put the number on here? Like a minus, I got higher than a C, and you didn't put like clear? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, that you didn't put like 100 to 90. 
No, I won't put this on the test. But that's if you get a score that's anywhere in here, that's the, that's the grade you get from that score. So you got that guy, so that would be the grade on that score. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I guess I didn't put the percentage on there either, but you know, when it's all of it to that. Alright, so that's got there. Um, good, alright. So yeah, any questions on how the grading works? Go ahead, Gary. What's an F? Uh, well, I guess I could keep going down. So, um, 69 to 60 would be a D, and then 59 and below would be an F. Yeah. Okay. Why do they skip E? I have no idea. I've always wondered that question, but I have no idea. Because you said E would have to be like excellent, something like that. Yeah, yeah. That might be why. Because some people use E for excellent, so. All right, good. So that's basically how that works. Um, yeah, there's a little bit more specifics here to your C pluses and your D pluses and your A minuses and blah, 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 but that doesn't necessarily something you care about too much. So. All right, so let's erase that then. Now, keeping your quiz out, I'm going to go over a couple of things. There's some things on here that a lot of people have problems with or could use some extra explanation because uh, the answers were close but maybe not exactly where I want them to be. And what I will often do with quizzes is when I hand them out the first time, it's the first time you've seen that answer, I'll be a little loosey-goosey on the answer. If it's not quite there, I'll still give you full credit. But if I see it again or a couple other times and I give you the same question again and it's not quite 100%, then I have to go and have to mark you off of that. So, um, so that's kind of how that works. Yeah, I think so. All right. So, uh, so we go over some of the questions here. So some of these you may or may not have gotten wrong. Um, first thing is anecdotal versus empirical evidence. Okay? And if you got these wrong, or if I give you the definition and it's not the one you put on the paper, I highly recommend putting what I say on the paper or in your notes. And I also, I think I've told you this already before, but I also always highly recommend um, taking those quizzes, never throw them away. Okay, maybe after class again. But, um, or after the semester, but years over again. Um, but because the best way to study for quizzes is to study your old quizzes. The best way to study for the final is to study all your quizzes. So, um, so whatever you got wrong, make sure you know why it's wrong, because that's the best way to get it right the next time. So one of the questions on your quiz was, what is anecdotal evidence? Lots of different questions, lots of different answers on there. The answer that I'm really, really looking for, however, is anecdotal evidence is a story that many people believe to be true, but at this point, there's no scientific proof. Okay? So more people should be writing, since a lot of people got that iffy. <laughs> so write that down. A story that most people believe to be true. <laughs> okay. Well, you can now, but you might not be able to later. Science Jim, you, I, uh, you didn't take me off of the frame of inertia. Okay. And Hold on a second. I saw you let people believe they're true. Something like this. It doesn't have to be word for word. Word for word? Yeah, word for word is fine. Does it have to be most people? Because anecdotal evidence can say that I believe that, I'm not saying this is what I believe, but that cats can fly. You know, I'm going to give you that. Because it, no, it, that's still anecdotal evidence. Let me say that. That goes so. Uh, Wait, could you say that it's up? That it's up? That's okay. That's a good point. Could you say that it's somehow possible? It's, well, it, it does say that it is somehow possible. Yeah. So all this says is it's a story that most people believe to be true. It doesn't say whether it is or isn't right. But right now, there's no scientific proof to indicate whether or not it is or isn't right. Like the Aspen story. There was a lot of people who believed chewing on this tree made them feel better. But until we did some science on it, we couldn't prove whether or not the tree had any good or not. 
the full moon. A lot of people believe the full moon makes people go crazy. But until we did some science on it, we couldn't tell whether or not it was true or not. It turns out it's not true. Does that make sense? Yeah. So anecdotal is really a story, something that a lot of people believe to be true for whatever reason. But at this point, we haven't really spent any time to do any real science with it to see if it's true or not. Right now, we have a story that most some believe to be true. Oops, sorry. All right. So. future is make sure you don't say whether it's true or not true, because at this point, you don't know. It's just a story. It might be true, it might not be true. Until the science is done, then we'll know a little bit better how true it is. Okay. Empirical evidence is basically So empirical evidence is evidence that can be shown to others and repeated to others. So in other words, there it is. This is my evidence. Oh, really? I'm going to try that. Look, I got it too. Isn't that special, right? So that's what, effort, that's what empirical is. I can show it to other people, and those people can also find it for themselves, and they can also show it to other people. So it's empirical evidence. So could it be evidence that can be proved? Could I say? I, I may give you partial credit for that, but, evidence, but anecdotal evidence could be evidence that can be proved. Well, yeah, like proved by scientific method? Anecdotal proved? could be too. Really? Yeah. Because remember, anecdotal evidence was a whole bunch of people would chew the tree oh, yeah. and feel better, right? Yeah. So that was evidence that could be true. So empirical evidence is evidence that is scientifically accurate. Exactly. You can show it to somebody else. Look, I believe that something makes this pencil fall. Look at that. That that pencil is falling. Look at that. You try it, Bob. My my goodness. Look at it fall. I can see it too. So, there. so that's empirical evidence, right? It can be shown to others to be true, and it's repeated. Where if I say, you know, I was walking in the woods the other day, and I came across this big hairy guy walking around. I can't show that to anybody else, and I can't necessarily have them repeat it for themselves. Okay? So, so anecdotal evidence is maybe we need to take a look at that, maybe. And uh, empirical evidence is it's right there. Right? Did somebody have a question? Did I heard somebody say no? Okay. All right. All right, so that's the difference between those. So, something like this is what I'm looking for for your definition. Specifically, it's a story. It's not true. It's not true. We just haven't done any science on it. Okay? That's not necessarily bad. Is that a definition don't that don't burden it with your judgments. All right? It's not necessarily bad. It just means these are a bunch of stories. Somebody's got to look into that. Right? Um, and, then, and then this one here is, uh, it, it's, it's, we, a bunch of us see it. A bunch of us can show it to somebody else, and a bunch of them can see it. Wait, should everyone be able to show it to everybody else, and everybody should be able to see it? If it's good, it's perfect. Yes. But so you said people can. Like, oh, yeah. like the pencil falling. Yeah. Like the pencil falling, right? I mean, why I say some is some people may not have the right yes. equipment. Like you and I can't go home and find the Higgs boson particle, <laughs> you know, because or, you know, like a, like the quarks inside the atoms. We don't have that equipment, but so not everybody can necessarily see it. But people with the right equipment who can do the right scientific investigation can repeat it, can see it, and can go from there. So that's what I mean by some, because some may not have the ability to see it. I always hate to use the word see, but there's no other word. Because see means, look at the red balloon, I see it. I don't, you know, see just means I can see it in the numbers, I can detect it with other ways. Yeah, perceive, yeah, that also feels like seeing it though as well, but because yeah, I don't necessarily move by your senses. Okay, anyway, so that's evidence. 
anecdotal versus uh, the other one. The other one, which was a tough question, I thought. So if you got this wrong, don't feel bad. But the one about frame of inertia, I really wanted to just see, because I didn't really define it in class. We talked about it a lot, but I didn't give you a definite definition to memorize and spit down on a piece of paper. So I'm just kind of curious to see what you guys did. Those of you that got it right, big thumbs up. Those of you that got it wrong, don't really worry about it. Because I didn't mark it wrong. <laughs> if you got it wrong, I marked it wrong if you got it right. How do we know that you just like Mosaku the first time? No, we didn't test. No, that one, so yeah. So, yeah, so you got that one right. Yeah. 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 Seat, relative to the 
for the plane, relative to the center of the plane, we're all moving together relative to each other. That's our frame of inertia. Okay? Good. So if it's relative to someone sitting in a rocket tube and they're taking off, isn't it you started such a fast speed that you get pushed back into the air? Like no. Like you force into? No. Oh. It feels like you do, but you don't. Well, in that case, it, we're, 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 that case, we're dealing with acceleration, which we'll actually get to a little bit yeah, later today. Yeah, because acceleration, when you're accelerating, it will take a little, you will be, you know, like a little... Right, right, and I won't feel about that today. Because in that case, the frame of inertia you're sitting in is not necessarily moving relative to you. It's changing a little bit. We'll get to that in a second, too. Go ahead. Are you getting any experiments today? Um, yes. All right, but not many. Um, so that's frame of inertia. Okay, go ahead.
did all this stuff together when we were, when we were playing with the concept of velocity. So now you basically know, and I think just about everybody got this one right, um, although there were some math issues, but I think you got the idea. Then when I asked you to do that one, that one, that one formula, uh, what is the speed? You guys were able to do your 50 divided by your 2.4 and come up with your 20.8 or something Wait, like that. Okay, so there's D equals V. D equals V over T. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, wait, no. V equals D over T. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. So, so most of you guys are able to get that right, which is super duper. We did a lot with that. Looks like you guys got that idea fairly down pat, which is great. So now, um, since we've kind of got that idea, we're missing something here. And that's this. We can break velocity down one step further. All right? Um, because we can give the concept here. So just because, let's take the example of, of you guys uh, running your race, right? Just because you guys ran your race, right? Yeah, that's not bad. Wow, that's actually good. Yeah, that's not bad. Usually when I dress up, I look like I'm a ballerina dancer, but that, that's actually not bad in this game. All right, so when you guys ran your race. We ran across the thing and we timed it. You guys ran it in six seconds, or you guys ran it in ten seconds, or whatever it was you guys ran the race in, right? We didn't run the race in there. Yeah, we timed it. All right. <laughs> teaching, I was teaching like four physics courses this year, so every now and then I'd be like, did we do this in class? All right. So, actually, it's five. So, uh, we ran the race. Now, we said our, your average speed was 11 miles per hour, 10 miles. Go ahead. Right, right. So your average speed was, we'll say, 11 miles an hour, 10 miles an hour, 3 miles an hour, whatever it might have been. Oh, hold on, wait, wait, let the teacher teach. Something about that quarter. All right, so, um, so you're, you're running at that, that average speed. But, like Beckett was saying, that doesn't necessarily mean you ran the race that speed completely. At the beginning of the race, it took you a little bit of time for you to go from 0 miles an hour up to whatever your final speed was. And at the end, by the time you're getting to the end, you're reaching the end of the track and you're going like, <laughs> and you cross the, you cross the end of the track on your hands and knees. So even though your average speed was 10 miles an hour, the speed you ran at may not necessarily have been 10 miles an hour that entire time. It may have changed. All right? Let me give you a little thing here about averages before we get into this. So the term average, you guys know this. But the trouble of averages is they're misleading. And here's why. If we were to take everybody's ages, here we'll just do this one. In class right here and now. Alright. So just tell me your age. Go ahead. 13. 13. Plus. 12. 12. Plus. Garrett. Uh, 12. 12. Plus. 12. 12. Plus. 10. 10. Plus. 11. Plus. 14, as of like today. What's your name? 
divided by 11 equals
Now, when I ask this question on quizzes, which I will most definitely do, this many, many students only give me this part, and I have to smack them around a little bit, because that's not right. You gotta give me both. There's a change in speed and direction. That's acceleration. Go ahead. We won't have today's quiz. Yay. Yeah. Right. So acceleration is a change in speed and or direction. Very, very important. We can also say, does anybody notice what this, and don't say it out loud, let everybody have a chance to think about it. We've got this term here, speed and direction. Is that ringing any bells for anybody? The term speed and direction should be ding, ding, ding. Isn't that ding, 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 ding? What is it? Kachinko! It's velocity, the city of speed that never sleeps. So we can also say acceleration is change in velocity. Because that's totally right. Velocity is speed and direction. So that's the official definition. Actually, if you look it up on the internet, you'll see acceleration is change in velocity. Oh, wait. Either of those is fine. They're both fine. Like, would one get higher? Nope. They both get full credit. Well, if you want to, but then you get full credit for both of those. Yeah. What if you're slowing down? That's an excellent question, and we'll get to that. Because that's still acceleration. But not in English, is it? Yeah, it's not in English. It's an excellent question. So, okay. So, Change the speed of direction. So uh, um, let me give you the fancy high school way of doing this. Delta V equals acceleration. Oh, that's what I found. I just said I'm getting both like you're amazing. So delta, this triangle here, it, mathematically, it's delta is the Greek word, Greek letter delta. It looks like a triangle, but it's a delta. Um, and it stands for change. So whenever you see that in front, it stands for change. And we're not going to do much math with acceleration because it quickly goes bad on us. Uh, it's, it's relatively typical, so I'm going to leave acceleration up to the high school. Yeah, Excel. But, uh, well, okay, acceleration. But delta V. Change in velocity. Now, Sam asked an excellent question. Wait a minute, though. In English, acceleration means speeding up, right? Right? You, you're at a stop sign and you're, and you're on your bicycle and you accelerate away from the stop sign. Um, you accelerate from the starting blocks and you start the rate. That's acceleration. That's true in English. What about beeps? What is this little Well, wait, 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 wait. But in physics, in physics, acceleration is a change in speed. So in physics, there's no such thing as deceleration. If you say deceleration to a physicist, he will snicker at you. <laughs> Alright? So don't say that. Unless you want to see if this is a sticker, it's coming to you. Alright, so. So acceleration really does mean. Depending on the physicist. Depending on the physicist, yeah, that's right. Tell them to figure it out. So you can also tell me this the definition of acceleration is speeding up. Or. Slowing down. Or <laughs> change of direction. <laughs> all right, just depends on how many of you you want to use on the quiz. All right, so that, all of those things make the same. What about speeding down? Is that slow? Curiously, there's no such thing as speeding down. You can speed up, but you can't speed down. All right. So let me ask you a question. Don't say it out loud. Now, I know you guys don't drive yet, but hopefully you're familiar enough with cars that you can get the answer. Is there are, so just think about it, don't say it out loud. What in your car causes you to accelerate? Yes. What in your car, as the driver, as the driver, what in the car causes you to accelerate? Um, so think, don't say it out loud. No, just think about it for a second. What in the car causes you to accelerate? Now, some of you may have one answer. If you have one answer in your head, you're wrong. Because there's more than one answer. Remember what the definition of acceleration is. Now, some of you may have two answers in your head. If you have two answers in your head, you're still wrong. Because there's 
as the driver, what can you do to accelerate the car? So wait, everybody, wait, put your hands up for a second. All right. Uh, so let's let everybody get a chance to think about this. What three things in the car cause you to do the definition of physics of accelerating? Give me one. Give me one. Um, the gas pedal. The gas pedal. That's, that's what everybody thought of first. That's called the accelerator, right? So that's the gas pedal. Very, very good answer. Good. Henry, give me another one. If you have your car in park, you take it out of park, it'll roll. Oh, that's true. Um, that would be gravity doing that. So I wasn't even really thinking of that. But that would be true. You could, you could actually include just the gearbox shift, as a matter of fact. So good. I didn't even think about that. Okay. So give me another one. Sam, give me one more. Brake. The brake, yeah. People like, so next time you're driving in your car on your way home today, and you're coming up to a stop sign, tell your mom and dad to step on the accelerator. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully they won't listen to you. And they'll stop the car, and then they'll be yelling at you. Why are you telling me to drive on seven? But mom, it's physics. <laughs> And then like, oh, that science gym. All right, so we got, so we got the, the accelerator, the, the gas pedal. We've got the brakes slowing down, and there is one more. Blaine, go ahead. Uh, can I make? Uh, I know both of them, but uh, can I make something that causes all three? Okay. Um. So the last one is the steering wheel. Good. Last one is the steering wheel. But what causes all three is you. The driver himself, or yeah. herself. Yeah, good. Okay, good. Okay, good. Okay, good. All right. So speeding up, slowing down. It could also be hitting a tree. But um, um, well, I guess that would be all three. Well, some of the well, no, nothing would be speeding up after you hit the tree. All right, because that's against the nerve shack. But we'll get to that later. So good. All right. So something to think about next time. This is great. When you guys are your driver's ed, and the driver's ed instructor tells you to step on the accelerator, and you hit the brakes. And he screams at you because you told me to hit the accelerator and in physics. So actually, I don't <laughs> recommend. Start working off the road. Yeah. <laughs> most most um, yeah most drivers and truckers really don't have a very good sense of humor, so I do not recommend doing that. All right. Go on accelerate. But anyway, now you know the rest of the story. Now you know what acceleration means. All right. So the change in speed or change in velocity. Now what we're about to step into here is a very specific type of acceleration. And it's the acceleration of gravity. Now believe it or not, gravity is really just an acceleration. Okay? And it was Einstein who came up with this idea. Because think about it. This is what he, the, the story goes that Einstein is bored out of his mind. Most of the greatest discoveries of all time came from boredom. Which is really kind of scary because nowadays we don't get bored anymore. Because the moment we get bored, we rip out our phones, we check for Pokemon or whatever we do, right? All right. So no longer is there any boredom, which means we're doomed. No, hopefully not. All right. But anyway, gravity. All right. So think about this. Let's say thought problem. This is actually Einstein's thought problem. Let's say you're minding your business and you're in an elevator. And you even have an apple. I don't know why. It makes sense. All right, there you go. Yay! All right, there you go. So you're in the elevator, and the elevator is a very tall building. And the elevator is going up and up and up and up very, very tall building. And somehow, oh my goodness, horror of horrors, the cable that somehow pulls you up the building because apparently you're in some place where they do this badly. The cable that's pulling you up in the building somehow manages to break. Sneak. And all of a sudden, down you come. Ah! All right, so, let me ask you this question. By the way, if you've ever been on one of those rides at the amusement park, it's the same thing. The ones that take you really, really high in, the, in, the, in those chairs, usually, and then they just drop you. In essence, that's what's happening here. So now tell me, or think, all right? Use, your, use a thought experiment like Einstein would do. Be a good life, but. So if the cable breaks, obviously the car is beginning to go, the elevator car is being pulled out. What, don't say it out but think what happens as the elevator car goes down. Before you hit the ground, we'll, we'll take this as a good case scenario, you don't hit the ground and die for some reason. But as it snaps and as it's falling, what happens to you? Do you let go 
go to the Apple or now? You let go of the Apple because okay. you're really not hungry at that point in time. <laughs> you lost your appetite, so you just throw it. You may like to go a lot more than the Apple, as a matter of fact. Um, right, so. <laughs> Show you that video later. All right, so down, so down comes the elevator. What happens to you? Think about the whole scene. What happens to you immediately? What happens to you over time? What happens to you when you don't hit the ground? So we don't think about what happens to you when you hit the ground. That's bad. Okay, but the dream you wake up. All right, but think about it. What happens? All right, so you want to try? What happens? Give me your best shot. Think you accelerate until you reach your velocity. Okay, but. What's your experience? That's a good, good physics definition. What's your experience in the elevator? You don't know what's happening like that. What's happening to you? You wouldn't know if it's if it snapped because if, how do you know you heard it? Okay. And you but wouldn't feel that you were going down. You what? No, I'm pretty sure you feel. No, because remember, if you're in like a boat and there's no windows, you can't like even experience your like long distance. So Becky, you think nothing. And you would just feel normal until you hit the ground and die. <laughs> Interesting hypothesis. Good. All right. Blake, go ahead. Please. I'm pretty sure that it's doing work if it was a perfect scenario, which on Earth, if this experiment was done, don't do this at home, um, then um, uh, it would not work because we have wind, we have um, all these other things. Yes, but we also. The elevator would probably hit the side of the building. You would feel it snap. Mm -hmm. But if somehow in space you had some beam laser that could okay. couldn't detect, and there was somehow gravity, and there was nothing around you, not even dust, then you would not feel it. You would just go down. Fascinating. So you would just stand on the ground of the elevator and just go down and not really realize what was happening. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. This is an answer, but I'm really thinking. No, it's not. <laughs> I have this building. I have this building attached to a cable. That's what it's um, So, anybody else want to, want to give that a different guess? So, everybody thinks if the elevator cable snaps, nothing. I think you would feel it. What do you think you do? Ah, uh, well, you just go all the way up there. Right. Um, So you you would feel what a lot of wind? What do you think? No, no, just like the falling. You feel the falling sensation. Would you stay on the bottom of the, of the elevator? Would you bounce to the top of the elevator? Would you? Would something else happen? Wait, hold on, I can hold on. I don't think so. So you think you'd stay on the bottom, but somehow yeah. you'd feel like you're falling. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it is. That's what we're parsing. Yeah, here's a matter of fact. Yes, it is. Um, in a way, it's part of it. That's true. What do you think? Go ahead. I, I was just saying that the only way that you would hit the top is if you were going slower than the elevator, but that's not really possible. So you think the elevator... You're the elevator, so you're going with the elevator. This, I've never had a class take this in this in this direction before. This is fascinating. Usually everybody gets this wrong, but they get it wrong the complete opposite way you guys do it. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, so good. Okay, so you think, wait, so what do you, you're saying if the, that you would not hit the top because it, you would have to be moving slower than the elevator. Yeah, but since you're in the elevator, you're... So would you still way. stay standing on the ground? In this yeah. Room? I mean, you would probably feel you. Falling. Yeah. You know, um, oh, wait, no. Why would you feel? No, did you want to add something? I think I think that you go to the bottom because what if you're accelerating? That would be pushing more, and you would have to accelerate along with the box. So it's possible that you feel a push quite Okay, now let me see if I can parse this out a little more then. So, you guys have gotten the idea of falling and accelerating. What's causing you all to fall? Gravity. Gravity. 
Would gravity work differently on anything in the elevator versus anything else in the elevator? Yeah. You're in the same frame, frame of inertia. Yeah. Oh, I see. I thought Wait, you guys were inertia so well. Okay, good. Oh, I have. Go All right, go ahead. Um, does the apple have to be there? <laughs> no, it doesn't. I just, I just put it in for grants. Yeah. All right. Okay, let me. Okay, try this.
So you no longer have any pull on the scale, right? There's nothing no longer pushing you up. You're being pushed down. Oops, third law, which we'll get to later. So in essence, if the gra if this thing broke, gravity would accelerate your elevator, you, your scale, your apple down, all the same way of speed, and you would perceive yourself to be weightless or in zero gravity while you're in the elevator itself. Go ahead. So, um, are you weightless when you are on a when you jump off a high dive on a diving board? So, are you weightless then because there's nothing holding you? Kind of definition of the word weightless, really. That's, that's, I really don't like the term weightless because it completely refers to you standing on a scale. But if you were standing on a scale somehow when you jumped off the high dive, high dive, yes, you would be weightless because no longer would you be able to stand on the scale. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, weightless is a strange term. Here it goes. It would be lighter? No, it would be zero. Well, yes, it would be lighter. It would be zero. Right, it would be zero. So as it fell, it would be zero. So good. So that's the term, basically, with what's happening with graphs. Let me show you something. I brought all my other videos up. I didn't bring this one up. Let me show you guys something. No, Two engineers study. 
rescue fluid behavior on board NASA's low gravity aircraft had some time to kill. And they got to thinking, what would happen if we pop a water balloon in space? This, that's Seth Lichter, now a mechanical engineer at Northwestern University. He thought the balloons might demonstrate some basic physics of how water behaves. And I started thinking about, well, what would Galileo do to try to illustrate the fundamental physics? And then it was just a fun factor. And that's Mark Weisselgall, now a mechanical engineer at Portland State University. NASA's low gravity aircraft simulates weightlessness by flying in a special parabola. Basically, trying to fly the path that a rock would fly if you just let it go. And then the plane did something like 60 of these parabolas, which is one low gravity thing after another. That's a lot of stomach drops, Lichter says. Go up the second cycle, I know I'm making that point. It's a 12,000 foot high over coaster. Every cycle of over the, the beginning is gut wrenching and they stop me. And then if I, uh, yeah, that's too much. <laughs> but if once you activate, <laughs> then it's euphoric. And for you, Dr. Lifter? Slightly better. Part of the appeal of the water balloons is that they give you an easy way to make big water blobs on the spot with no fancy equipment. And that's because of the way that the balloon pops. You can see here in these high-speed videos, when you pop a water balloon, even here on the ground, the first thing that happens is that the latex unwraps leaving behind a big ball of water. On the ground, of course, that doesn't last long. Only for a split second, then gravity starts working on it, and the, the water blob starts to fall, and it takes that nice spherical shape. This, by the way, yeah. goes it's to your idea early on. Anything before the water dropping from the building. The water dropping from the building. The air rips it apart. It's right right there. So that's why raindrops are a certain size, and it's bigger, and it's bigger, and air drag. Now imagine a rain drop with zero gravity. It's not just the balls that fall down. And zero G, certain tension, can then tumble together any size of Because it's the only force acting on the bottom. So, the size of a rain drop in space. Unlimited. For science writing, in Florida, Lutin. Oh, the pattern. Look at the drill. So rocket cool. So that's the idea with the with the elevator, right? The elevator falls, you fall. In this case, it's not an elevator; it's literally an airplane. The airplane is literally falling out of the sky, right? It is going down at the same rate of speed that gravity would pull it down. If it fell out of the sky, that's exactly what it would be doing. Luckily, it's doing it in a controlled fall so that nobody dies. They might throw up, but they don't die. Um, so that's what's going on with it. They are falling the same time. Now, let me ask you a well, question. Why does it say microgravity? Microgravity is a little bit better because there is still, yeah. it's, it's actually all of these things are slight misnomers because there's still gravity, and we'll talk about that in a second too. Um, the gravity is perceived to be different because you're falling. So let's see, at this point. So you can see here in these high speed videos, when you have water, a water is now a mechanical engineer at Northwestern University. Demonstrate some basic physics of how water behaves. Uh, so notice it's falling here. If the water bubble is falling there, why? Because the plane is going. The plane is starting to change. Go ahead. What's the plane? It's not. Well. If they were in free fall. It was falling, it was staying still. Now it's starting to fall. So what, you're, you're very close to back that idea up a couple of seconds. The plane? Sort of. Go ahead, can you help? It's changing direction, it's sort of. Yes, right. It's, it's not quite going up yet. But what it's doing is it's starting to level out its flight. So it's not dropping as fast. So now the plane is dropping slower than the balloon is, the water balloon is. So you're basically right, right. Does that drop in as fast? Go ahead. Is this like, I know, like, um, I think it was, I said, like, um, like, 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 Space time. Now, 
gravity goes. There's no such thing as, that has been detected yet as anti-gravity or non-gravity, yes. which is a very unusual thing in its own right. All right, let me keep going because we're starting to run a little bit late on, on today. So, so indeed that's what's happening. It's going back up there a little bit. So there was a really fun uh, thing that I did a while back. So notice how the, the plane goes up, stops, or kind of slows down and starts to fall, right? When it hits this part here and starts to fall, that's when the people inside begin to feel weightless, right? Because the plane is falling, they are falling, the balloons are falling, the equipment is falling, everything is falling. Is falling. Sky is falling, everything is falling, right? All right, same speed. Now, a lot of people say they're in a low gravity environment or they're in a no gravity environment. It turns out that that's really, really wrong. Because even the people in the International Space Station, and you may have seen some people float around and move around the International Space Station, we'll do a video on that a couple of days as well. But they seem to be weightless in space as they're floating around. Truthfully, as they're in space, their weight is 90% of what it would be on Earth. Gravity's pull is almost as much to them in space, 90%, as it is to here on Earth. Gravity's pull is still very, very strong. So if they weigh, say, 200 pounds on Earth, they weigh 180 pounds on the International Space Station. So you're like, well, how in the world are they floating free if they still weigh that? Well, because if they stood on a scale, the scale would float away from them. There's nothing for them to stand on. Because the International Space Station is falling away from them as fast as they're falling away from it. So they are weightless in space. But it's not a low gravity situation. It's still is almost as high gravity as it is here on Earth. All right, Blaine, go ahead. Uh, just a question. You said there's no anti-gravity flight. Right. Uh, what, what would happen if you replicated that on the plane track, and I'm just saying this theoretically, and you went faster than light, and you saw, and, uh, but would that create anti-gravity where like, instead of going down, you go up? I don't believe your speed would necessarily affect the force of gravity. Okay. Yeah, not that I know of. But if you have zero gravity, wouldn't you go, like, super fast? Because if, you, if there's zero gravity, like, if somebody went to do something outside of the, um, let's say, aircraft is if they let go, they would go further and faster than the cockpit. It's probably as fast as the light away from the space station. Because basically, even the middle of the force, we push them really fast away. Yeah, we'll talk more about that when we get to the third one. And in a second, too, for that matter. Because um, it wouldn't quite work that way. But. All right, so now these secrets. There's basically three secrets, three things I want you guys to take down here. Because these are things that your mom, your dad, your aunt, your uncle, your hamster, your parent people. May very well not know the answers to. Some of you guys know these because some of you guys have been before. Some of you guys aren't going to know all of these. Alright. So thing number one. Gravity, Gravity secrets? Alright. So thing number one, and don't say it out loud unless some of you guys know this, is what Kind, I guess I guess some kinds of things have a gravitational pull. So what kind of things would attract things to it? What kind of things gravitational pull? Anybody else want to make a guess? So anything? What do you think? Anything with mass. Anything with mass? Okay. Anybody else want to make a guess? Um, so really you think a pencil has a gravitational pull? Henry, go ahead. What's the question? Because that was the question. Okay. If, what kinds of things have a gravitational pull? So everybody thinks the pencils that you're holding up have a have, have gravitational pull. But we'll say this. All right. So indeed, that would be true. So everything. So the answer to the first one would be everything has a gravitational pull. All right. So all mass. All mass. 
Now the thing with gravity though is that it is insanely light. It is a very, very weak force. So for something to have enough mass in order to have other things be attracted to it, you need a huge, huge, huge amount of mass. It is something like the mass of a really an asteroid, uh, a large mountain. A large mountain is a very small amount of gravitational pull. It has to be really large. Gravity has a very weak mass. A, sorry, has a very weak force. It's the weakest of all the four forces. All mass. Now this one, if you don't have to write this just down, by the way. if you dropped. Something heavy and something light. Oh, I know this. Yep. What? It's first. So if you drop two objects, a heavy object and a light object, what hits first? So what happens here if you drop two things, so Galileo gave this a try. He dropped himself on the power. Way back when. Way back when. So way back when there was a fellow by the name of Aristotle, this isn't Aristotle, this is Galileo, we'll get to him in a second. We'll leave him at the top of the building for a second. Aristotle was a fellow who was a great philosopher, incredibly smart, and Aristotle basically made the conclusion that the heavier something is, the faster it will fall. The lighter something is, the slower it will fall. And honestly, according to observation, pretty good empirical evidence, really, because whenever you drop something, you drop a piece of paper or a rock, the rock drops faster. You drop a feather or a flounder, the flounder falls faster, right? So, so whatever you drop, the heavy thing's going to fall faster. So it's pretty good and very clever to that. But he never tested. Years later, 400 years later, a fellow by the name of Galileo comes along. And Galileo was like, I know this is what everybody says, but has anybody tried it? And then they tried it. So the story goes, Galileo gets to the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and he has two objects. He's got a watermelon, and he's got an apple. Depending on the story, there are a variety of different things. Since this never actually happened, we're just going to make it up. Well, that would be part of the problem. The problem, yeah, exactly. So he's got two objects: one that's relatively heavy, one that's relatively light. He's got another guy at the bottom. Of the top, at the bottom of the top here. Going, I'm a ready to go. He says it in Italian because they're in Italy. I can't do the Thai accent without offending people. So that's yeah. it. All right. So he's at the top of the top of the thing. He goes one, two, three, and then to the count of three, he drops both objects at the same time. <laughs> and the guy at the bottom notices that they both hit the ground at the exact same time. And so they make two discoveries. The first discovery is that the amount of mass, the amount of weight something has, doesn't matter. All things will accelerate towards the ground at the same rate of speed. And since he dropped a watermelon and an apple and they smashed on the ground, he also discovered fruit salad. How many people know that? Right, so, um, so indeed, they figured that out. That, that, now, the thing is, in Galileo, you know, this is the story and the legend. The truth is, this probably never happened. Because Galileo was the, one of the first scientists. What does science do? It takes notes. It doesn't let anybody figure out what they did. The point of science is to be repeatable, so they take notes. He never wrote this down. If he did, he would have written it down. Now, what he did write down, which is far more clever than this, because that would have worked because of air resistance, all right? So what he did do is he had this ramp. It kind of went, whoops, that's supposed to be straight. All right. So we have these ramps. And what he did is he created several spheres, or he just had several spheres, several balls. And some are lighter than others, some are heavier than the others, but they're all about the same, the same diameter, about the same size. So he dropped the spheres, and he timed how long it took the spheres to go down the ramp. And he noticed that by doing that, it didn't matter. The heavy sphere hit the finish point as fast as the light sphere and everything in between. So he discovered that mass weight doesn't matter. Gravity accelerates 
all things equally. All things speed up due to gravity at the same rate of speed. Go ahead. He had a light sphere? He said a sphere of light. Yeah, lighter um, spheres than heavier spheres. Go ahead. Then why is it that if I'm at the skateboard, if you're really big guy on a skateboard, and he put down the ramp, and I put down the ramp, he goes a lot faster than the ramp than I do. Good. That's momentum. It's an excellent observation, actually. Right? And that's due to momentum, which we will get to later. But very good. Very good. Go ahead. It, that, we're going to get to that later because that's going to come to the fact of friction, air resistance, which is a type of friction, and momentum, and we will get to that. Which is why Aristotle saying the bigger something is, the faster it will fall really makes sense. There's a lot of empirical evidence for that. The big guy on the skateboard, the bowling ball on the ramp, right? There's a lot of empirical evidence. But this is why science can't use anecdotal evidence. We need to go to empirical here. So, Wait, uh, so okay. yeah, but that that was, there's a lot of material people out there. Well, yeah, there really kind of is. But in this case, the empirical evidence doesn't really work. Um, even though it's, you can see it, it's there's something else going on. And Galileo was able to see what else was going on. And we'll get to that later too. So, um, so good, you guys. So basically, that's how that works. Uh, so let's go to. So all things. Okay, so we go back here. Back to the secrets. We drop something heavy and something like what hits the ground first. It's going to be dust. They hit the ground at the same time. That hits. We write this down. At the same time. What do you already know that? Yeah, then you don't have to write it. So, and what you probably want to write down here is gravity accelerates all things equally. Let me put that down right here. So you guys have something to write down. Gravity accelerates all things equally. Um, Yeah. 
This is NASA's Space Power Facility in Cleveland, Ohio, and it is the world's biggest vacuum chamber. It's used to test spacecraft in the conditions of outer space, and it does that by pumping out 30 tons of air in this chamber until there are about 2 grams left. And it's got an eccentric construction part of its history. It was built in the 1960s as a nuclear test facility to test nuclear propulsion systems, and that meant that they built it out of aluminium to make the radiation easier to deal with. Aluminium is not the best thing, the strongest material to build a vacuum chamber out of. So they built out a concrete skin, which is part radiation shielded and part an external pressure vessel, so that this thing can take the force present on the outside when it's pumped out to the conditions of outer space. Galileo's experiment was simple. He took a heavy object and a light one and dropped them at the same time to see which fell fastest. slower rate than the bowling ball because of air resistance. So in order to see the true nature of gravity, we have to remove the air. Two millitor in the last 30 minutes. But once it's complete, there's a near perfect vacuum inside. 60 mm for a man with 10% voltage. Station 1, go for drive. PCB 30 1, pressure set away. Yeah, go for drive. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, jump on. Two, one, release. But that's really pretty cool. 
Well, and I mean, Brian Cox is one of the most famous physicists now, around now. He's done a lot of amazing work. And then Brian Cox is like, dude, that's pretty neat. So, because we're not used to that. We live on our planet where things don't necessarily work the way physics says they're supposed to work, even though they do. And the reason they don't appear to is because of air and friction. That is kind of something that we've been battling uh, to try to figure out. So for Galileo to really see what was really going on there was truly an amazing, truly an amazing thing for him to do. Uh, Galileo was no slouch. Right. So very cool. All right, now, so those two things you knew. Ooh, I didn't want to do it. Bring that back. Up. So, let me go back to the secrets here. So we've got two of these secrets. One, I can find it, but I got it. It's all right. So gravity secrets. So what kind of thing is gravitational pull of all mass? Ask your moms and dads, parents, friends, family members. Can't necessarily ask your brothers or sisters, but um, <laughs> what kind of things are gravitational pull? And indeed, most people will say suns, stars, black holes, neutron stars. I kind of won't say neutron stars, but because they probably don't know what they are. But most people will say moons or stars of the Earth and the sun. Where truthfully, everything does, but it's got to be huge before it's perceivable, before you can see it. Theoretically, if you were out in space in the middle of nowhere, but there's no gravitational bodies around you whatsoever. And you're there somehow on your own. No spaceship, no nothing, right? And you've got a golf ball somehow in the middle of space. And you're standing there with a golf ball and you're bored because, you know, you're like in the middle of space. And if you took the golf ball and let go of it and waited for a long, long time, indeed, the golf ball would be slowly but surely attracted to you and you would be slowlier and surelier attracted to the golf ball. So eventually, Tank, right? You plug into one another, right? And if you did it right, well, this would be probably impossible, but it's a nice thing to think about. If you did it right and you took that golf ball and you left it there, and then you gave it a little flick, so you gave it a little speed, it could potentially go around and around and around you and orbit around your head for perhaps ever, which is kind of neat. Now, because you're elongated and not a sphere, that wouldn't work. But, so everything has gravity. And by the way, I didn't tell you guys this. But the moon also has its own gravity, and it's pulling on the Earth. How hard is the moon pulling on the Earth? Exactly as hard as the moon is, as the Earth is pulling on the moon. They're pulling on each other equally. Newt's third law is the way it's got to work. But the thing is, we are so much bigger, and we happen to be next to it, that we're not really pulled towards the moon. Although that was one of the theories why people are insane. All right? We're not necessarily pulled towards the moon. But the tides are watery. The reason we have tides on this Earth is because the moon's gravity pulls the water. And it can pull the water several feet. Tides can be huge. Now, truthfully, the Earth itself, land, also has tides. But it's only like a centimeter or so that it gives and takes with the moon. Now, here's the interesting thing. The moon, indeed, is pulling on you as you're sitting here right now. But it's mediocre. It's minor. You can't really feel it. But if you were to stand about nine inches away from somebody, you would have the same gravitational pull to that person as the, as the moon has on you right now, which is kind of neat. So next time you feel attracted to somebody, you might just be standing too close to them. Back up a couple of inches, that might be the problem. It'll save you back when you get to high school. I feel attracted. Mm, no, never mind. Just kidding. Just grab me. Never mind. All right, go ahead. Um, also, what's not matter? We'll talk about that some other time. All right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I need to keep going on this lecture, though, but I'm talking about that some other time. All right, good. So these guys here are really pretty cool. Now, one last thing I want to give you guys, and that's this here. And I need to do this some two thought problems. So pay close attention. So the thought problem goes like this. Let's say you are minding your business and you happen to have a rifle. Oh, wow. You mind your own business. You mind your own business with a rifle. And you're in the middle of a field where it's nice and safe and there's nobody around. But it's not just any ordinary rifle, it's a rifle from the land of Newtonia, right? Which means 
that when we fire the rifle, one bullet goes, na 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 it goes firing for the butt, for the bullet, and eventually, dun, 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 hits the ground, about a mile away. About a mile away. But at the exact same time we drop, we fire this bullet, another one drops, doink. Remember, don't say anything. So we've got bullet A, we got bullet B. One bullet is fired at, we'll say, 720 miles per hour, about the speed of sound that some rifles can fire at. The other bullet is just dropped, as if I were dropped to go to finish and hit the rifle. However, they were both at the same time. The moment that this bullet leaves the gun, this bullet is dropped again at the same time. Question is this, don't say anything. Question is this, which hits the ground first? Right, yeah, pay the pay attention. Um, so when you shoot in this direction, this one drops in the direction, which hits the ground first? This one or this one? So think about it. All right, now, while you're thinking of that thought problem, I'm gonna give you another one, two, two thought problems in one. And that's this, let's say, that you fired your rifle and you have now become a wildlife biologist. And you're minding your business in Madagascar. And you are a wildlife biologist and you are doing a survey on the marvelous monkeys of Madagascar. That's a tree. <laughs> and you from the tree is one of the nefarious monkeys of Madagascar, all right? They're very large. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. Now. I can't see what it is. <laughs> I don't think you're a monkey with an arrow. All right, so, <laughs> let's say, oops, that's not what I wanted to do necessarily. Actually, it kind of was, but not 100%. Let's say you've got a laser sight, and your laser sight is pointed directly at the shoulder of the marvelous monkey of Madagascar, all right? which means as you pull the trigger, theoretically, you hit the marvelous monkey of Madagascar in the shoulder. <laughs> However, what happens if the moment that bullet is fired, it's a dart, it's a dart gun, it's a tranquilizer dart, so the no marvelous okay. monkeys in Madagascar are hurt in the making of this dart problem. All right, so you fire the dart. But at the same moment the gun goes, the monkey lets go of the tree. Whack! Right? They say whack in Madagascar. All right. <laughs> It's monkey fur, <laughs> okay? Or, oh no, he's shooting me with a duck. All right. So the moment that the gun is fired, the monkey lets go of the tree, which means the monkey starts to drop from the tree the moment the dart is fired. The question to you, young mindful Newtonians, is does the bullet, again, not out loud, does the dart hit the monkey exactly where it was aimed, or does the, does the dart go above the monkey, because the monkey's fallen, or does the dart go below the monkey, because that's the other hypothesis that's possible. So, what happens? Does it hit the monkey, does it not hit the monkey? There you go. Now, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. let's go back to this problem over here. While your brain is churning and yearning and... Whatever matters over there. All right, so we go back over here. So this bullet is fired. Point, point, point. And this bullet is just trapped. Yeah. Okay. So, the question is, which one of these bullets hits the ground first? The answer is, how many people say A hits the ground first? Raise your hand proudly and with great joy. Or don't. You can raise your hand timidly and with fear. No? Okay, do I right? Which one of you says B will hit the ground first? Raise your hand proudly. B is it. I vote for B. B is it. <laughs> How many people think both will hit the ground at the same time? No. Good. Yeah. <laughs> both hit the ground at the same time. They hit the ground at the same time. Why? Because of the final secret of gravity. Gravity not only cares how big something is, good care about it. if something is a walrus, if something is an elephant, or if something is a wicked make you bad. Gravity doesn't care. All things fall, accelerated to the earth at the same rate of speed. Just as if gravity doesn't care about weight, gravity also doesn't care about what it's doing. If an object is going sideways, up, down, backwards, left, right, whatever it's doing, gravity shall pull it downward with a rate of speed of 9.8 meters per second squared. Well, we won't necessarily care too much about that actual number. So, let me go back to this problem over here. Go ahead. Oh, 
would be hit the ground first because the uh, the um, bullet are shaped differently. They're more elongated, elongated, and so the air resistance from the bullet this way is more than the air resistance because the bullet would drop and then the weight would probably pull it down, and so it's more. No, nope. no, nope, because both bullets would be falling if you go this direction. But you just so say that you said one of the bullets drops from here, and then the other bullet fires. So the green. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so over here, let me change this question a little bit. Well, you can probably see this coming, but I want to change the perception of the question. Reach into your minds. All right, so let's say somehow, this is impossible, somehow, we did this exact same scenario in a situation where there's no gravity. So if I asked you this question, and it's a world of no gravity, does the bullet hit the monkey? Yes. Yeah, right? Not even a thought, right? Because the monkey lets go of the tree and just like, oh crap, right? It doesn't go anywhere. It's just right there. This didn't work as well as I was hoping. Right? Okay. All right. So if there's no gravity, no question, the monkey gets shot. But if there is gravity, does the monkey get shot? Some of you may say yes. Some of you may say no. Some of you may say, it's the time to go. <laughs> All right, this is the time to All right, let me show you the video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is No. In this case, it's somebody from MIT. All right, here we go. Is it a real monkey? Yes. It's a real stuff monkey. Oh, real stuff monkey. All right, you've all got your guesses, right? Does the monkey get shot? So here we are. There was the monkey. Attached by its head. It's the Yeah, I think so. It's a curious story. The monkey can.
And speed doesn't matter. Let me go to the 13 meters per second. That's just a thought problem. Well, well, technically, if you shot it's pretty a gun, wouldn't it be straight? It is? No, yeah. no it's the same way. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, because yeah, it's the same distance. So fast. Right, okay, here it is. This is the faster one. And just notice how the faster one just hits it higher. So if it's a bullet yeah. and going at 720 yeah. miles an hour, it's going to like one centimeter. Exactly, right. And you guys really already know this. Any of you guys who remember throwing a ball and the person standing further than one foot away from you know this already. Because when you aim the person across the way, you don't necessarily think about this, but it's true. When you aim to that person, you don't necessarily aim directly for his or her chest, right? When you throw in the football in the main place, it's in the chest or the mitt, right? You don't throw it directly at the mitt because what's going to happen? Kang, 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 it's going to hit the floor and roll for the individual, right? It's not going to work. So you automatically put this formula in your mind. Your mind does it for you, which is absolutely unbelievably cool. So your mind automatically goes, eh, all right, I'm going to throw it up here because I know your mind is like, I know gravity is going to pull it down at 9.8 meters per second. So that cosine of 7 is that, okay, good. And so you throw the thing and sure enough, right into the mid and the guy's out. Right? Yeah. Whatever it might be. Right? Exactly. So, that's the way that works. So your mind automatically allows for gravity to work. Even though you guys didn't know when I gave you the problem, that's the way it works. Your mind knows it, even though you don't know it. Which is like the coolest thing ever. Alright, now, let me ask you one more question. And I'm going to leave you with this to think about over the week. Right? And in fact, if I remember right, I will make it a homework question. Yes. Write this down. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me finish with the secret. I haven't really given you the last and final secret. So the last and final secret really is that gravity, and I'm not going to write down that whole problem, but the problem is the shooting the monkey from the chain problem, or just the shooting the bullet problem, which one hits the ground first. And then the, the final secret is that gravity doesn't care, basically. Gravity, right? Pulls all down. That's what we said for number two. Equally. Whether it is moving or not. I am a question. No. So gravity pulls all things down equally, whether it is moving or not. Going up, going down, going sideways, no matter what it's doing, once it's released and gravity can control it, gravity shall yank it to the earth with its cold vengeance eyes. Poor monkey. Don't put those notebooks away yet, because there's one more thing I'm going to give you guys to think about. Everybody got this one? Yep. Yeah. So those are the same three secrets. So when this comes up on a quiz, what are the three things gravity needs? What are the three secrets of gravity? The three secrets are basically going to be that everything has a gravitational pull. Really? Everything has a gravitational pull. Everything, everything has a gravitational pull. Two, all things are accelerated towards the Earth at the same rate of speed, no matter what they weigh. Weight doesn't matter. And three, moving doesn't matter. All things will be accelerated towards the center of the earth, whether they are moving or not. They will be accelerated towards the center. Right? Those are the three things. We'll talk more about that next week. All right. Now let me give you the final secret. Well, not the final secret, but one more. Thing. All right. So that is. Think about this. Many years ago, like 12, 18 something years ago, I was reading a website. It was a NASA website. And the website gave me this question. It said that if I had a ski ramp, like a yeah. ski ramp. No, but I draw the picture, because this is going to be part of your homework. I'm going to ask you to, to answer this and explain this in your homework. Why do I keep doing that? So 
So let's say, somehow, we have two ski jumps. Or they can be a snowboard or a ski or a skateboard. So we have two ski jumps. And the whole idea with the ski jump, right, is you go down the ski jump and then you go as far out as possible on land. That's the whole idea. If you ever seen a ski jump, it's absolutely rocking cool. It's up there like this in midair. <laughs> I would love to do that, except I would do it once and die. <laughs> anyway, so, I still love to do it once. So, uh, so off we go. Now let's say somehow, some magical in the world of Newtonia way, that we are able to create two absolutely identical schemas with two absolutely identical guys with two absolutely identical skis. You get the point. Everything's identical. Except that for some reason, one of these ski jumps is on the Earth. That's easy to imagine. But the other one, on the moon. <laughs> All right, so the other one is on the moon. Everything else is the same. So the question is this. On which scenario, moon or earth, Please. does our intrepid loyal ski jumper jump further? Will you put that in the work or do I try to jump? I will write it down. Write this picture down. Should we make, could I add to an answer? No, not yet. Because okay. I want you to do it for a moment. So the question is this. You've got two ski jumps. Everything about them is identical. One is on the Earth, one is on the Moon. Which ski jumper goes far? And because we're in a wonderful land in Newtonia, we will, for the time being, ignore air friction. Okay? So ignore air friction. Which we don't have to ignore on the Moon, because it doesn't exist anyway. But we will ignore it on the Earth. So we'll take that out of the grave. Everything else, including air friction, is identical. Moon and Earth. The only thing different is the different planets, heavenly bodies. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you guys. Good luck. That will be part of your homework. You don't want to discuss anything with your mother and dad and see if they know the secrets of gravity. What about women? Thank you.